I am very excited to welcome Madeline Miller to the Gaith Gaithersburg Book Festival this afternoon. Uh, the acclaimed author of the Orange Prize winning The Song of Achilles, Miss Miller again returns to the ancient world of gods, heroes, and heroines in her new novel, Circe. I read Circe a few months before its release in April, and I was so excited to share the book with everyone, I quickly went back and read The Song of Achilles and was angry that I had waited so long to discover it. The Song of Achilles, for those of you that don't know yet, is a retelling of the love of two characters from the Trojan War, Achilles and Patroclus. While that may be the Iliad, her new book, Circe, is based off the Odyssey, but also so much more. It is a wholly original work of fiction, a retelling of so many Greek myths and legends that I grew up with, but I had a hard time relating to or putting into a humanized context and timeline. The title protagonist, Circe, uh, the daughter of the titan god of the sun, Helios, does not fit in amongst her kind and often turns towards the world of mortals. Weaker than the other gods, she discovers the power of witchcraft and is banished to exile by her father. Uh, this epic, sweeping vision of the world of the Witch of Aiaia spans generations and encompasses many of the myths and legends we know from that time, from the Minotaur to Daedalus and Icarus to Jason and the Argonauts, Medea, and of course Odysseus, Penelope, and Telemachus. The novel is gorgeously written, adventurous and fun, tragic and evocative, and a fascinatingly unique perspective on the far too common masculine-held interpretation of history and legend. Madeline Milliner is an expert and teacher of Greek and Latin, and her new novel is another example of how she is able to breathe new life into these ancient yet unforgettable characters. So please join me in welcoming Madeline Miller. Hello, how are you? Um, it is so nice to be back. The Gaithersburg Book Festival was just incredibly supportive of the Song of Achilles when it came out. And coming and doing this event was one of my favorite things that I did with the Song of Achilles book tour. So it is really special for me to be back. Thank you. Um, I wanted to start just by reading two very short passages, and then we're going to talk. Uh, so Circe is most famous for turning Odysseus's men to pigs in the Odyssey. Um, but she also uh, has some other parts of her mythology. She's the daughter of the sun god Helios. She's a goddess, and she's the first witch in Western literature. So the first passage that I'm going to read comes from towards the beginning of the novel, um, after she has been exiled to the island of Aiaia and is first discovering her witchcraft. And her witchcraft is distinct from her divinity. She is born a goddess, but she makes herself a witch. Let me say what sorcery is not. It is not divine power which comes with a thought and a blink. It must be made and worked, planned and searched out, dug up, dried, chopped and ground, cooked, spoken over, and sung. Even after all that, it can fail as gods do not. If my herbs are not fresh enough, if my attention falters, if my will is weak, the drafts go stale and rancid in my hands. By rights, I should never have come to witchcraft. Gods hate all toil. It is their nature. The closest we come is weaving or smithing, but these things are skills, and there is no drudgery to them, since all the parts that might be unpleasant are taken away with power. The wool is dyed not with stinking vats and stirring spoons, but with a snap. There is no tedious mining. The oars leap willing from the mountain. No fingers are ever chafed, no muscles strained. Witchcraft is nothing but such drudgery. Each herb must be found in its den, harvested at its time, grubbed up from the dirt, culled and stripped, washed and prepared. It must be handled this way, then that, to find out where its power lies. Day upon patient day, you must throw out your errors and begin again. So why did I not mind? Why did none of us mind? I cannot speak for my brothers and sister, but my answer is easy. For a hundred generations I had walked the world, drowsy and dull, idle and at my ease. I left no prints. I did no deeds. Even those who had loved me a little did not care to stay. Then I learned that I could bend the world to my will, as a bow is bent for an arrow. I would have done that toil a thousand times to keep such power in my hands. I thought, this is how Zeus felt when he first lifted the thunderbolt. 
The second, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, the second passage comes from more towards the middle of the novel after she has already started turning men to pigs. And the he in the passage is Odysseus. He asked me once, why pigs? We were seated before my hearth in our usual chairs. He liked the one draped in cowhide with silver inlaid in its carvings. Sometimes he would rub the scrolling absently beneath his thumb. Why not, I said. He gave me a bare smile. I mean it, I would like to know. I knew he meant it. He was not a pious man, but the seeking out of things hidden, this was his highest worship. There were answers in me. I felt them buried deep as last year's bulbs growing fat. Their roots tangled with those moments I had spent against the wall when my lions were gone and my spells shut up inside me. After I changed a crew, I would watch them scrabbling and crying in the sty, falling over each other, stupid with their horror. They hated it all, their newly voluptuous flesh, their delicate split trotters, their swollen bellies dragging in the earth's muck. It was a humiliation, a debasement. They were sick with longing for their hands, those appendages men use to mitigate the world. Come, I would say to them, it's not that bad. You should appreciate a pig's advantages. Mud slick and swift, they are hard to catch. Low to the ground, they cannot easily be knocked over. They are not like dogs, they do not need your love. They can thrive anywhere, on anything, scraps and trash. They look witless and dull, which lulls their enemies. But they are clever. They will remember your face. They never listened. The truth is, Men make terrible pigs. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for reading that. Um, I guess my first opening question uh, is, what brought you to write about Cersei? What uh, first drew you to this character? Mm -hmm. So uh, my relationship to these myths in general goes back quite a long way. Um, with Song of Achilles and, and really with the whole, my whole relationship with Homer, um, it started because my mother used to read the Greek myths to me, in particular bits of the Iliad and the Odyssey, starting when I was a very young child, around five, um, which now she thinks makes her sound totally inappropriate. But <laughs> I really love these myths, and I completely fell for them. Um, I don't have any memories of her reading about Circe to me in particular. I do remember her sp saying the first line of the Iliad, which begins, you know, sing goddess of the destructive rage of Achilles. My first memory of Circe comes from when I was 13 years old, um, and I was in eighth grade, and in my school, everybody read the Odyssey in eighth grade. So I was really excited, because this was the first time, although I had been reading these myths and hearing them from my mother, that I had my own copy of the Odyssey, and I was highlighting it. I was, I was just, it was nerd heaven for me. <laughs> um, I was making notes in the margins, and it got to the part where, you know, Odysseus lands on the island of Aiaia, Circe's island. And this was a really interesting moment in the text because Odysseus, at this point in the story, has he's fought for 10 years at Troy, and he's been trying to get home for two years already. And in those two years, he has lost 11 of his 12 ships. Only one ship is left. All those men on those ships, all dead. And most of them he's watched die. He's seen them torn apart by cannibals. He's seen their ships sunk in front of his face. He's seen them eaten by the Cyclops. So this is a moment of, of real emotional exhaustion, of grief and despair on Odysseus's part. That's the Odysseus who lands on Aiaia. Um, it's a beautiful, lush island. He goes exploring and sees a little smoke drifting above the trees. So Odysseus you know, sends some of his men to go explore who lives on this beautiful island. And the men go up and they find a gorgeous palatial house with a garden out front. And in the garden, there are tame lions and wolves lolling around. That would have made me a little suspicious. But they went right up to the door and knocked, and Circe opens the door, and she welcomes them in, and she says, here's food, and here's drink. Turns out she has drugged the drink, um, and so after they have it, she uses her magic and turns them into pigs and drives them out to her sty. 
Now, one of the men didn't go in, so he goes to tell Odysseus. And Odysseus is going to now has to come up and fix it. And on his way to her house, he gets a visit from Hermes, the trickster god, the traveler god, who says, you know, Circe is actually a pretty powerful witch. So I'm going to give you these herbs that will make you immune to her spells. So Odysseus takes them and continues on to the house. So at this point in the story, my 13-year-old self was so excited because I was thinking, you know, this is going to be a really great scene. She's smart. She's powerful. There are so few female characters in ancient mythology like her with that kind of independence and kind of interesting edginess. Um, and she and Odysseus are going to have a real battle of wits. This is going to be a great scene. So he comes in. She serves him the drugged wine. He drinks it. She tries her spell. It doesn't work. And then he pulls out his sword and threatens her with it. And she screams, falls to her knees, begs for mercy, and invites him into her bed sort of all in one breath. <laughs> and I just remember, as a 13-year-old, this profound feeling of disappointment. I thought, is that it? I, I understand, you know, she's the obstacle and he's the hero. He has to overcome her. But it just seemed like such a gross putting in place. I mean, literally, I mean, even my 13-year-old self could tell the phallic sword, you know, phallic symbol with the sword. And so here she is, this, this untamed female power has to literally get down on her knees um, in front of the hero. And so I didn't know that that feeling of frustration would eventually become this novel. But I do think that that was the, that was the initial seed. Mm. Um, but as I continued to, to study these things, because I, I did go on and become a classicist, um, and I, I took undergrad, and, and I also have my master's in it. And so, of course, I returned to the, to the Odyssey, because it's one of my favorite texts, and I returned to Circe. And what I, what I found as I came back to the text is actually something totally different, which is that I think Circe has been really unfairly vilified in, pop, in popular culture. Um, oftentimes, what people remember, of course, is the pigs. And I understand, because it's very memorable. But I think people tend to think of her as kind of the black widow spider, the seductress luring men into her web. And they think of her as this totally kind of evil creature. Um, but Homer is actually doing something much more complicated with her. So after this moment where she and Odysseus kind of, you know, he sort of puts her in her place, um, they become lovers. And she invites him and his men to stay on her island. And she says, you know, you're exhausted stay and heal. And he stays for a year. And at the end of that year, he actually doesn't want to go home. His men have to come and kind of say, you know, remember Ithaca, shouldn't we get going? Um, and she then gives him all this really valuable information. She's the one who tells him how to get past the sirens. The, got the sirens, there they are. Um, <laughs> they're, uh, I know. Uh, the, the, they're bird women who have you know, beautiful voices that enchant men and lure them to their deaths. Um, she tells him how to get past Scylla and Charybdis, the whirlpool and the monster. So even though she is sort of tamed, she actually becomes this very benevolent figure. She becomes one of the most helpful deities that he encounters. And she does retain a lot of her knowledge um, and her wisdom and her power. And she's actually also the one who gives him advice on how he has to go and talk to um, a dead prophet, Tiresias. And she tells him how to go and summon the spirits of the dead from the underworld. You know, again, kind of witchy power um, and witchy knowledge. And she's literally, by, by telling him how to do it, she's literally giving him the dimensions of the pit he has to pour the libations in. So that was interesting to me, too, is that she's really this very complex figure, that she's frightening in the beginning, but also a, a healer and, and sort of a wise figure. Um, and I think, you know, at the root of all is also the, the mystery about her character. Why is she turning men to pigs? Mm -hmm. Homer never tells us, and Odysseus doesn't ask. Um, and so I, I wanted to kind of explore all those aspects, that complexity of her character, the pigs, and also to sort of keep the camera on her a little bit longer and not just sort of make her the cameo to Odysseus' story. Well, you certainly do a fantastic job of explaining that backstory or your imagining of the backstory of Circe. Um, and the scenes with Odysseus are um, just kind of a small part of the book, really. You're, there's so much more um, that you explore. What texts other than um, the Odyssey did you use to flesh out the novel and, and do research on the novel? Or any other um, modern day retellings of Circe? 
So I, I actually stayed away from modern retellings. Mm -hmm. um, there are some wonderful, wonderful uh, modern interpretations of her character out there. Um, Margaret Atwood has some poetry about her. Um, there's uh, a really interesting Eudora Welty piece about her. Um, but I, so I knew those were there, but I deliberately did not read them because I wanted to be kind of, you know, doing it myself, interpreting it for myself, and not pushing back or trying to, you know, make sure I was not doing something that they were doing. Um, I have now read them, and as I said, they're they're fascinating. Mm -hmm. But in terms of ancient texts, um, I drew a lot from Ovid. Uh, she appears in Ovid's Metamorphoses, which means the transformation, so it makes sense why she would appear. She's a goddess of transformation. Um, but Ovid's portrait of her is very... Um, I would describe it as thin. <laughs> he is really interested in her power, and so he likes to do the parts where she's casting spells and angry, but he's not so much interested in her three-dimensional character. Uh, it's kind of like she's a very lovelorn figure who's always falling in love with the wrong guy. It's sort of every episode is, he's just not that into you. <laughs> and then she you know, transforms the guy into something or the woman he loves instead of her into something. Um, so I kept one of those stories from Ovid. Uh, there's a love triangle with Circe that is in Ovid. It's her and Glaucus, who's this god who used to be immortal, and then a nymph whose name I'm not going to say because it's a little bit of a spoiler, um, although it is a 3,000-year-old story, so it's always hard to know <laughs> if that counts. Um, so, so anyway, so I took Ovid, but I, I reordered that triangle mm -hmm. so that Circe still makes the same horrendous mistake that she makes in Ovid, but she has a little bit more reason for it. Mm -hmm. And I also make her live with the consequences for you know the rest of her eternity. Um, so Ovid was a major source. Uh, Apollonius of Rhodes. Um, there's an episode where Medea and Jason show up on Circe's island. Um, that's right out of the ancient mythology, and that was actually one of the episodes I followed most closely, and I was most excited to follow because Medea is, you know, first of all, we have this meeting between these two great witches of ancient literature, um, but also Medea is Circe's niece, so they're also relatives. Um, that's one of the things that, as I was exploring Circe, was really fascinating, is realizing that as a titan, she's related to all these other interesting figures. So she's, I said she was the daughter of the sun god Helios. That makes her cousin to Prometheus. Um, she is the aunt of Medea, as I said, and also the aunt of the Minotaur. So really fascinating you know, connections there. Um, so as I said, Apollonius of Rhodes. And then there is another myth that was really important to me, um, which we don't have, actually. We only have a summary of it. So the Iliad and the Odyssey are the two epics that have survived, but they were not the only ancient epics. And there was one called the Telegony. Um, again, there's a little bit of a spoiler, but I'm just going to go for it. Uh, and it's about Telegonus, who is Circe's son by Odysseus. And in that myth, he grows up on the island of Aiaia, a demigod raised by his mother, and then at some point goes off and, and looks for Odysseus. And so I followed that story. Um, and that was a really fascinating story because it does bring Penelope back into Circe's orbit. And you know, if there's one character that I was really itching to write about, Penelope, um, who I think Homer shows as being even more brilliant than her brilliant husband. So knowing that she was waiting for me in the last quarter of the novel was really a pleasure. Um, so those were those were the major ones, but you know I also I also took little bits here and there from other places. Um, Daedalus and Icarus. Anytime you're writing about the Minotaur, Daedalus and Icarus, are, of course, are there. And so I drew a little bit on sort of moments from Virgil where he describes Daedalus that I, I really liked. So just you know scattered bits, but those were kind of the main pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, you you mentioned Penelope um, as one of your favorites, but did you have any other favorites uh, characters that you were really excited to? Uh, bring to life in a new way from your research? I will say that as an author, if you have the opportunity to write a Minotaur birth scene, <laughs> you have to do it. <laughs> so I did. Um, so I, I was definitely looking forward to that. Uh, but less gruesomely, um, I, I was actually really invested in the character of Daedalus. Um, he's always been a character I've liked. He's, he's the creator, the artist, the great inventor of the ancient world. And I thought that he and, um, he and Circe are right on opposite sides of the line. She is this goddess who's really drawn to the mortal world. And in fact, Homer tells us 
fact that she is the dread goddess who speaks like a mortal. So she even in her voice has a little bit of mortality to her already. But Daedalus is, is the mortal who can do things that are godlike. He can create things that are so amazing that they draw the gods' eyes or that feel like they were almost made by gods. So I thought that that would be interesting. And they're both very interested in, in their craft. You know, she, it's witchcraft for her, but it's woodcraft and metalcraft for him. And so I thought that would be an interesting combination. Um, and I've also always found his story so sad uh, as, as sort of a father um, and what he goes through with his son. I, um, all the women that I mentioned were really a pleasure to write about Medea, Penelope, and I was also really interested in Telemachus, who's Odysseus's son by Penelope. Um, I think it would be very hard to be Odysseus's son, and so I, I wanted to kind of look at that. And one of the things about Telemachus that I feel like gets overlooked a little bit is that, of course, he was raised by a single mother. Odysseus was away for his entire, by the time Odysseus shows up, he's 21 years old. And Odysseus has been gone for all of that. And so there's all this talk in the Odyssey about, you know, he's his father's son, his father's heir. But the person he's been living with, who he's probably most like, is his mother, who's been raising him that whole time. So I wanted sort of to, to explore that connection, too. Great. Uh, you mentioned er <coughs> earlier that Circe was the first witch in uh, Western literature. Did you, uh, in the course of writing this novel, do any more research on um, witches in literature throughout the um, centuries? Uh, and how do you think that has changed, if it has changed at all? Um, no. Sure, um, I did. I did do. I did do some, and, and there's so many different strains of witches out there in literature. Um, Circe belongs to kind of the sexy witch category, uh, but there, you know, definitely lots of others. Um, there's the foreign frightening witch, that's Medea. Uh, she kind of comes from that, but she's a little bit of the sexy witch as well. Oftentimes these categories overlap. They're not absolute categories. Um, but one thing that I, I think just kept coming up again and again as I was looking at these witches is that witch is really the word that we use for women that have more power than we think they should have or they have sort of a frightening amount of power. Witches are often the embodiment of anxiety about female power. Um, and so, so that was really interesting to, to think about it that way. And what really struck me as I was looking at the history of, of witches is that we still use that word. That word is still really potent, surprisingly potent. Um, and you know, if you, if you Google any major female figure, um, and then you Google, you add witch to it, you will go down a whole rabbit hole of memes and nasty articles. It's really kind of disturbing, actually, um, how much that word is still with us. So, so that, I, you know, I didn't know any of that. Mm -hmm. um, the good news is, is that there also seems to be this, this growing acknowledgement that, um, that witches can also be good. Thank you, J.K. Rowling mm -hmm. and Hermione Granger. Um, and, uh, and actually, I didn't know this. This was a, a, a really fascinating piece of the story for me. But L. Frank Baum, um, in creating Glinda the Good Witch, his mother-in-law was one of the first, so she was an early feminist, and she was one of the first people to write about how you know, witchcraft and persecuting witchcraft is actually not about, really about fighting the devil. It's about misogyny and about controlling female power. And so he, influenced by her writings, created Glinda the Good Witch. Um, to sort of honor the fact that oftentimes these witches who were persecuted in witchcraft trials were just, you know, women who knew a little bit of herb craft who were helping people, and then the village fell on bad times, and they became the scapegoat. Um, so that was really, a, I, that was so nice to hear. It just totally changed the way I looked at uh, The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Uh, Cersei, obviously a very powerful woman uh, title character. You also have powerful goddesses uh, such as Athena and uh, Achilles' mother in the first book. Um, but what was the role of uh, mortal woman, women in Greek society and how did that compare and contrast with the gods and goddesses? Mm. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, this is one of the things that is kind of interesting is that you do have female goddesses in Greek mythology who have enormous amounts of power. As you said, Athena, um, Hera, Aphrodite, Artemis, these are incredibly powerful figures. But if you are not one of those women, if you are one of the lesser goddesses, as Circe is, 
um, or as Achilles' mother is, if you are a nymph, you basically have no power at all, and you are, are, you're a pawn or you are prey. Um, and the other gods push you around and they do whatever they want with you. And then if you're a mortal woman, you're really in trouble um, because you're not going to have, you know, a powerful father. Circe does have, you know, her father is Helios, the sun god, which gives her just a little bit of, of something. Uh, but for mortal women, both in mythology and in actual ancient Greek culture, life was generally not great. Now, it really depended how your life was in terms of what class you were. Um, and, and how that played out. If you were the, the highest aristocracy, your life was incredibly secluded and limited. You oftentimes didn't even leave the woman's quarters of the house. You were, you, know, you were under your father's care, and then you married your husband, and then you were under his care, and if he died, then you were under your son's care. And so you were constantly sort of, there was always a man who was supposed to be in charge of you, um, and you weren't often let out of the house. Uh, and so, so I think that was very, you know, obviously not great. Uh, and then you could have more freedom if you were, for example, a hetaira, which is kind of like a high-class courtesan. You got to go to all those symposia, those intellectual meetings that Plato describes, where, you know, men talk philosophy and sit around drinking and have dancing girls. Um, but then you were also a sex worker at the same time. So, you know, there, there were very limited options for women. And if you were one of those courtesans, you know, you would never have any sort of status or respect in society um, outside of, you know, your role as sort of an accomplished um, courtesan. So, you know, life was, was, really, was really tough. And part of what I wanted to bring out in this novel is how there are all these different female characters who are kind of trying to find a way to have some independence, some power, some agency in their own life. And they, they sort of attack that from different perspectives, and they're more or less successful. Mm -hmm. But they're all kind of trying the same thing. Which did you prefer writing, Circe or the Song of Achilles? And which character's voice did you uh, prefer, like Circe's goddess's vo goddess voice or Patroclus's mortal voice? Oh, you can't, you can't, I can't choose. <laughs> <laughs> Was one easier than the other? Um, they uh, were, you know, they were, they were very different. I think that, um, I guess you could say Song of Achilles took me 10 years and Circe took me seven. So I guess you could say Circe was three years easier. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that... You know, when I was writing Circe, at least I knew I had done it before. I, I knew that I was, it was totally different. I'm not sure very much of it went over and, and helped that much, except for the fact that I knew I, I was capable of it. When I was writing Song of Achilles, you know, for your first novel, I think there's always this feeling of like, shouldn't I just give up? Like, why am I still doing this? No one, no one is waiting for this. No one cares. Um, you know, and I got to the point where I was kind of in my eighth year of writing The Song of Achilles, and my family and friends were like, don't ask her about the Achilles novel. She's never <laughs> going to finish that. And, you know, but so with Circe, there was, it was a little bit easier to know that, yes, I had written a book. I had finished it. I could do this. Um, but Circe's world is a very large world with a lot of characters and a lot of gods and mortals. And so, so that was tricky. And it was also tricky because I did want to bring in a little bit of that divinity to her voice. Um, and so I wanted her to experience time differently. And I wanted some of that to be reflected in the narration. And that was just a lot of trial and error, just trying different things with the voice and, and until it could flow organically in a way that I felt like captured a little piece of that. Hmm. Oh, um, <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong, but Odysseus was the only major character to appear in both of your novels. Um, could you just talk a little bit about what it was like to um, uh, write about that character from a different perspective, mm -hmm. uh, one of the most you know, talked about characters of all time, um, and also if your writing of him changed at all uh, between the two novels? So I... I mean, writing about Odysseus is just, it was one of the most fun things with Song of Achilles. He was one of my favorite characters to explore because he makes such a wonderful foil to Achilles. Um, and so part of what I loved exploring when I was initially writing about him is that, you know, with Achilles, Achilles is the brash, young, idealistic, um, honest to a fault. And Odysseus is the exact opposite. Odysseus is the politician. He's the older man. He's the liar, the storyteller, you know, the diplomat. You can kind of cast it better or worse, depending on, on how you want to look at him. Um, 
But, you know, there's so many times in, in the Iliad where you want to say to Achilles, you know, if you could just be a little less honest, <laughs> your life would be a lot easier. Um, but he can't. That's just not who he is. But Odysseus, well, he, he'll just, he would rather lie to you probably than tell you the truth. Um, and he's constantly working some angle. He's, he's the, the ultimate pragmatist was, was sort of how, how I looked at him. Um, but it was fun to revisit him in Circe because I feel that he's at such a different place in his life that you know he has now seen so much more brutality and violence. He's, yes, he is victorious. I mean, he's the person who comes up with the Trojan horse that ends the Trojan War. So that's you know a wonderful thing for him. But also the sack of Troy was, and the sack of any city in the ancient world, either in the mythology or in history, is an ugly, ugly thing. You know, the, the women are enslaved, the men are killed and put to death, everything is burned, there's just brutality after brutality. So he has now lived through the sack of Troy. And then he's lived through these two years where he has lost all his men. You know, when he left Troy, theoretically, he had all his ships were stuffed with treasure, he was going to come home and hear a hero, and by the time he lands on Circe's Island, he has lost almost all of that. Um, and he doesn't even know if he's going to be able to get home. So I, I wanted to, to come back to this character at a much lower point in his life when he is really kind of pushed to the, to the edge. And I, I also wanted to explore him. I mean, Odysseus definitely likes to expand to fill all possible room. Um, so one of the things I wanted to do with this novel is as fascinating as I found him, I wanted to really hold him to a cameo. Circe appears in two plus books of the Odyssey, so Odysseus is in two plus chapters of this novel, and I kept him to that. Um, but he, other characters, as they come in, Penelope and Telemachus, they, they talk about their experiences with him. And I did want to explore a little bit sort of that part of his journey that's the veteran soldier coming home. Um, the ancients absolutely talked about PTSD, they didn't have that word for it, but they talked about veterans and veterans coming home and what it was like to sort of try and reintegrate into society when you had been away and, you know, constantly on edge and hypervigilant for 20 years. Um, and so I wanted to, to bring out a little bit of that struggle, which I think honestly is already present in the Odyssey. Those of you who have, has anyone here read, read the Odyssey and the Odyssey readers? So at the end of the Odyssey, Odysseus comes home and his house is being besieged by these suitors who want to marry Penelope. They're trying to force his wife to marry them because they say Odysseus is dead, he's not coming home, so choose one of us. And in order to, to really put pressure on her, they're living in the house, eating all his food, drinking all the wine and just, you know, plotting against Telemachus. They're making total nuisance of themselves and, and they've become really quite frightening. So Odysseus comes home and he murders them all. Which, you know, by ancient Greek rules is okay. They were, they were definitely hostile to you. Um, he also murders all the people who helped them. He murders all the maids who were forced to sleep with them. And then when the families of the suitors show up and say, you know, hey, those were our, those, they were guests in your house, his first instinct is to murder them as well. And so it's just the violence just keeps going and he just keeps meeting every obstacle with violence and violence and violence. And eventually Athena has to come down and sort of say, okay, that's it. We're done. The killing is over. Odysseus is home, you know, end scene. And that's sort of the end of the Odyssey. But is that, is that the end? Can a goddess just come down and say, okay, now it's over, now the violence is over? Um, and aside from, you know, Odysseus is possibly struggling with the temper, which he already shows in the Iliad and the Odyssey, um, there's also the fact that he is such a restless intellect. You know, are you really gonna be happy on Ithaca where you're thinking about goats all the time? You know, and the, after you have shaped the vision of the world for 20 years. So that was something else that I, I was interested in exploring is just, you know, I, I didn't want to have any answers. I just wanted to be asking a lot of questions about Odysseus. So uh, who's catching your eye now? Who's next uh, to get the Madeline Miller mythological realist <laughs> treatment? Um, so I'm not sure. There are two projects that are, uh, that are of interest to me. I, aside from a background in classics, I also have a background in theater and directing Shakespeare plays. So I, I, The Tempest has been kind of bubbling away for a long, long time in the back of my head. But in terms of the classical world, the Aeneid is the other great love of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I am looking towards the Aeneid, and I did just 
order a whole bunch of books from the library on Carthage. So I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Uh, at this point, we'll open it up to some questions from the audience. Uh, so, yes, sir. So, so Hecate or Hecate, you can say it both ways, um, is sort of the goddess of witchcraft. And she's a very elusive figure in some ways in the ancient world because sometimes she's associated with Artemis. Um, in fact, sometimes Hecate is just another sort of sacred name for Artemis. Um, she's also called Trivia, the goddess of the three ways, tri, wea. Um, and, but she is kind of the Ur witch. She's the original witch. And in some versions of uh, Circe's story, she's Circe's mother. Um, I didn't go with that version, but that is that is out there. I don't think she's going to show up uh, in, in, any, in any future stories, but she is definitely part of that whole history of representations of witches in, in literature. Um, so the gods in the ancient Greek world are really, if, if people here know any of the myths, they're really horrendous. <laughs> um, they're totally selfish, totally self-involved. They are very happy to squash anyone to get what they want. Um, the, the classic story that I always like to use as an example is the one about Artemis, where she is bathing in a moonlit pool one night in the forest, and a poor hapless hunter happens to wander by, and he sees her naked in the pool, which is forbidden. And it doesn't matter that he's sorry, it doesn't matter that it was an accident, she turns him into a deer and has him torn apart by his own dogs. So that's, that's the Greek gods, that's Circe's family. Um, and part of what I, I wanted to do is, is really honor that cruelty. And, and I think sometimes we have domesticated the gods in our stories. We make them sound a little bit nicer and less frightening than they, than they were in the ancient world. But I wanted to return that, that frightening aspect, um, that they really are, are only out for themselves. They have so much power that they have no empathy at all. So I was sort of thinking sociopath. <laughs> So far, I have not been drawn in that direction, um, but I, I love it when people do that. I, I always think it's interesting, and, and I love reading other people who are doing that. Um, but no, not, not yet, not yet. Maybe, maybe it will come, but I, for me, it always sort of, there's never a moment where I'm like, well, what would be a good thing for me to write about? It always comes from the character. The characters kind of grab me and speak to me with their voice. So no modern version has, has done that yet, but I, will, I would definitely do it if it did. <laughs> Yes. So th the question was about uh, Mary Renault um, or Mary Renault. I never know. Does anyone know? How do you really say it? Does anyone know? I have not been able to get a straight answer out of anybody. Um, okay. So we'll go with Mary Renault because that's what you said. Um, so it was really, I, I think in ninth grade, I read The King Must Die. Um, and, I, and what was really interesting about her work that I noticed right away is that she takes the gods out. I think she's coming from this perspective of the gods are not real. She's looking for sort of psychological causes behind everything that happens. You know, the people in the story think it's Poseidon, but she makes it clear we know it's an earthquake. Um, and in that sense, I think she and I are really writing in a very different genre, because I think she's writing much closer to historical fiction, and I consider myself more like mythological realism or, you know, there, there are gods and monsters and centaurs in my novels, um, as there are in Homer's world. Basically, I take Homer's world for my world. So my work is more like, sometimes I call it literary adaptation. Um, 
So, but I, I think her work is fascinating, and I and I I love that it's out there. I had not. I'm really ashamed to admit that when Song of Achilles came out, I had not read a lot of her. I hadn't read her Alexander novels. Now I'm really embarrassing myself. Um, and then people started saying, you know, you should really read these. And then I went back and read them, and I, you know, I loved reading them, and it's fascinating. And her perspective on all that stuff. I mean, she was such a passionate classicist, and she felt these stories so deeply. So, um, so it's been wonderful. But I, I do think that she and I really write. Yeah, in very different ways. Yes. Well, you commented, and I think uh, probably a lot of people had the same experience of when they first read the Iliad or the Odyssey in the eighth grade. Uh, was that the right age to uh, read? <laughs> <laughs> So I think I think everyone everyone is different. I was definitely ready for it. I, I don't know. I guess I was a very dark five year old, but I you know <laughs> I was ready for it then. Um, but I, I think I think eighth grade can be can be a great time. I think younger can work. I think if you have a good translation, particularly I, I don't know if any of you have heard or, or read the Emily Wilson Odyssey. I would 100% recommend it. It's the new Odyssey that just came out this fall um, by a Penn scholar whose name is Emily Wilson, and she really she's so smart. But what makes the translation so good is that it's really exciting. And these were exciting stories. You know, these were stories that you went to for entertainment. Um, and so, so they should feel really suspenseful and vivid and bold um, and pulse pounding. And she, she really returns that to the Odyssey. So I, yes, eighth grade and, and that version, I would say. Um, for people who are looking to read the Iliad, I, I always like to recommend, and this is true of the Odyssey too, uh, audiobooks, because I think that unless you have a really strong background in a lot of the mythology, it can start to feel like, oh my gosh, it's, I'm on my 1,000th name that I don't know. Should I be remembering who you know, Protosilus is? Do I need to know that name? And I think the audio version helps you kind of filter out. You, you let it go by you a little bit. And of course, that is how they were initially, you know, originally back in, in ancient Greece. That's how they were experienced. They were all oral tradition. And so I think the audio book kind of helps relive that experience and, and makes it more vivid and, and then you stop worrying about the names. So, yes. Do you have any uh, interest in uh, Scandinavian or Egyptian mythology? I, I love both of those mythologies. Um, I have not studied them the same way. My husband does read Old Norse, so he, he gives me a little bit. <laughs> Um, he, I, so I get a little bit from him, sort of secondhand. Uh, I do, I do love the Egyptian mythologies, but I would need to do a lot more research before I, I ever wrote about any of them because I don't feel like I have that same grounding that I do. But I love reading about them just as a layperson. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the question was, uh, what drew me to writing fiction? So I have been writing fiction pretty much since that same age that my mom was reading mythology to me. Almost as, as soon as I could write, I've been writing stories. But I, I think I was just obsessed with stories and books as a child. I was one of those children that read all the time, constantly, round the clock, walking to school. I hit a lot of poles <laughs> as a child. Um, I mean, I really just never stopped. And, and I think... But what was strange is that I was only writing contemporary fiction. I never actually considered writing about the ancient world. They were like two completely separate, non-touching interests. You know, I was obsessed with classics and I was obsessed with writing. Um, and it wasn't until I was out of college that I made the connection and sort of thought, wait a minute. And, and what made the connection was theater. I directed a production of Troilus and Cressida, which is Shakespeare's version of the Iliad. And if any of you, um, I don't know if you've read it. If you haven't read it, do. It's nasty and funny and angry and really just, he just lets all these guys have it. Um, and it was so exciting to work with all the stuff that I've been studying academically in a, in a creative way where I was helping to shape the story that I didn't want to stop. And at that point, I had actually planned to write my thesis on interpretations of Achilles and Patroclus' relationship over the, over the years and in various forms. Um, and as soon as I, the play was finished, I thought, that's not a thesis, that's a novel. 
I want to write it as a novel. And so that was sort of the beginning of me of me making that connection. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Writing is, I think, just writing and stories have always been with me. Yes. conversation. Um, oh, gosh, what a great question. Um, I mean, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to say Virgil. I think I have to go with Virgil. <laughs> I would want him to recite the Aeneid. Supposedly, he was an absolutely amazing reader of his own work. So I would love to hear him. I would, I would demand that he, that's not a very fun dinner party for him, but I would ask him to recite the Aeneid to me. <laughs> Um, one other question uh, I had, uh, with your background in theater, do you have any plans to adapt any of your novels into a play? I would love that. Um, I actually, there was a staged version of the Song of Achilles uh, at one point, which I, they basically just took my text and kind of cut it down, and I worked with them a little bit, um, and that was really, really exciting. So I, w I would love to, because these characters, as I'm writing, um, it does sort of feel to me both that I'm putting on the character kind of like an actor getting into getting into character and also as if they're delivering their monologue to me, the monologue of, of their life. So, yeah, I would absolutely love to, to see them on the stage. Great. Any other questions? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, there, um, thank you. Well, I will ta I take that as a great compliment. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, I'm hoping there, there may be some news coming. I, I have to be very careful how I say this. There may be some news coming soon about Cersei in another medium. That's all I say. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Another question? Yeah. First of all, I, I listen to both books on Audible, and I agree with you 100%. They're really, I really enjoy Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. you, you uh, I'm not a scholar, uh, but I'm uh, very interested my whole life. I'm uh, very like you. Um, you refer to Homer as though he was an actual author of a, of a story. Interesting things I ever heard many years ago was, it was how long it had been only an oral tradition that had sort of accumulated from who knows how many people. Did that play into, or did how, how aware of, of that fact are you when you're writing mm. uh, these realistic versions of something that, that came up so organically? So the, the question was about Homer and. Um, my sort of how much I took him as a as a real person. So I talk about Homer as if he is a person, but I actually don't really believe he was. Um, or or if he was a person, he was one. He was maybe the most popular or the most gifted bard who was receiving these stories. I mean, the ancients believed he was a historical person, a blind bard. Um, but as you say, these stories are all oral tradition. They have, you know, the Trojan War, if it happened, happened around 1200 BCE, um, if it happened in any form. And then Homer was composing, if Homer was a person, around 700. So 500 years have passed of, of oral tradition and of these stories being passed down. Um, so I definitely don't think that he was, you know, that there was one person shaping all this. Um, what I, what I do think, and, and the way I think that that affected my work, is that, is that I felt comfortable to change things, because I, I feel that you know, there's no one version. There are all these different versions out there, um, and that it's OK for them to ebb and flow and shift and you know, follow the demands of, of the teller and the audience. Um, and the other thing I think that I, I always think about with oral tradition and Homer is that I think nowadays we often talk about these stories as if they are um, 
sometimes they have a little bit of a reputation for being elitist or for you know just a particularly you know a group that's educated in a very particular way. But these stories were truly for everyone. I mean, they, they were the stories that grandparents passed down to their grandchildren. Everyone knew these stories. They were stories told around you know the campfire, um, and. So when I write these novels, I really want them to be for everyone. I want to honor that original part. You know, people who know the myths, I want them to be able to have some extra goodies in there. But you don't have to know the myths at all to read the, to read my novels, and and that was really important to me that I would give you everything you needed to know, because um, I think they should be for everyone. Um, on that note, let's have a, another round of applause for Madeline Miller. Thank you.